And thank you for giving me this uh, job of talking about whether cervical arthroplasty has earned its place as a gold standard. And, and I'm going to show you data that for, for certain patient populations, yes, I think it has earned its place as a gold standard. Um, we have just started our third decade of cervical arthroplasty research. 20 years ago, this past May, I implanted the first disc replacement in the United States, and we are now currently actively bringing in to our office our, our 20 year follow-up patients. I mean, th this is uh, re remarkable data that we have and remarkable data that we're gonna continue to have. Um, and as Jack said, this is the best data in all of medicine. They, there's no other procedure or device that has been looked at more carefully in prospective randomized trials than cervical arthroplasty. Um, right now, there are seven uh, cervical discs approved by the FDA. Um, we're going to talk about the most recent two, simple, the Simplify and M6, in just a minute. We're going to talk about the three cervical FDA trials ongoing right now. But there have been discs that have come and gone. The Brian is, 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 is not uh, uh, marketed anymore. The original Prestige is not. The PCM went away. But what is remarkable about all these is that we have this tremendous data, data bank that the FDA has required. And as Jack uh, very clearly showed, this is an enormous amount of work for the researchers doing this, for the patients that, that, that are involved. But we have a tremendous amount of data, prospective randomized data. And as Jack said, now we have level 1A evidence with meta-analysis. I, I would like to go over some of these meta-analysis regarding cervical arthroplasty versus ACDF with you. One of the first uh, that was done in 2016, looking at eight of these prospective randomized con controlled trials, and, and the results are quite impressive. In these eight uh, R RCTs that comprise over 2,000 patients, follow up four to seven years. I would call this sort of midterm uh, follow up. Really, I think 10, 20 years is really long term data. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But arthroplasty had a higher rate of overall success. And that is a composite that FDA mandated a composite score uh, that's made up of NDI success, neurologic success, no adverse adverse, uh, no major adverse events and no no reoperation. So arthroplasty, higher rate of overall success, higher rate of NDI success, which is uh, defined as a 15 point improvement in, in the NDI. That 15 points has been uh, determined to be the clinically significant uh, change that, that, that we need to have for patients to, to, to know that there is a uh, si significant cl clinical change in, in their outcome. Arthroplasty had a, had a higher rate of neurologic success, which is um, no change or, or an, an improvement in, in the neurologic status. Arthroplasty had a lower rate of adverse events compared to fusion. Arthroplasty had a lower rate of secondary surgeries and functional outcomes were better in the arthroplasty group. And specific functional outcomes that were statistically better for neck disability index scores, visual analog pain score of the neck, visual analog pain score of the arm, SF36 physical, uh, physical component score, statistically better, patient satisfaction, where patients would, would uh, have, uh, would, would tell their family members or, or friends that, that, that yes, uh, I, I would do this again, statistically better, and a, a lower incidence of adjacent segment degeneration in the arthroplasty group compared, compared to the fusion. And, and, and this meta-analysis concluded uh, that it supports the superiority of uh, arthroplasty over, over ACDF on efficacy and, 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 and safety a really, really strong uh, conclusion from one of these meta-analyses. The most recent meta-analysis actually published just this year, looking at 30 prospective randomized controlled trials. And again, they found the same thing, arthroplasty better in overall success, neurologic su success, and NDI success. Again, a 15 point improvement in the uh, N NDI score. They also found that there was lower dysphagia and dysphonia um, in the arthroplasty com compared to the fusion, lower incidence of adjacent segment degeneration and lower reoperation rates. So again, this most recent meta-analysis showing significant um, 
improvement uh, in outcomes, arthroplasty over, over fusions. And we do have long-term data. I'd like to just um, review with you, as, as I told you, we're now following our 20-year patients uh, actively right now in our office, but we published our 10-year data a few years ago with very, very good follow-up at our uh, arthroplasty uh, group. We had over 86% follow-up at 10 years and our fusion group, we had 92% follow-up. And this classifies as, as level one uh, data, more than 80% follow-up. Uh, and we certainly surpassed that. What we found at 10 years was that there was a statistically significant uh, improvement in the NDI score, uh, arthroplasty over fusion, but it probably wasn't clinically significant, only, only eight points. So maybe half of what needs to be a um, minimal clinically important difference. But statistically, NDI score was better at 10 years arthroplasty over fusion. There was really no statistical di difference in neck pain score, but uh, as, as you see, both groups profoundly better than they were preoperatively out to 10 years. And the same with arm pain scores. Again, we uh, have seen significant sustained improvement out to a decade in both groups, which is um, quite reassuring. I think as cervical spine surgeons, we can be very reassured that these operations uh, have a lot of durability over a long, long period of time. Um, looking at reoperations at 10 years, really interesting. We found there were no target level reoperations, uh, no reoperations for pseudarthrosis, no reoperations uh, to revise the, the artificial disc um, all the way out to 10 years. We had a 21% total reoperation rate, 9% arthroplasties, 32% the controls. What's interesting, that is not statistically significant in, in this group, but maybe over time, there certainly is a trend showing higher reoperation rate in, in, the, in the control group. What's interesting that we don't talk a lot about though is not necessarily adjacent level reoperations, but what I would call remote level operations. And this occurred not only in the arthroplasty group, but also in the control group. What does it mean when we have a reoperation two or more levels away from, from the target? Um, is that lumped into adjacent level? It's really not adjacent level. And what does it mean? And I, I think that's something that we don't spend a lot of, of time talking about. Uh, but I think maybe maybe really important. So the most uh, recent FDA approved discs, M6 uh, and the simplified disc, actually I was the largest enroller in both of these FDA IDE trials. So I have a good amount of experience with both these discs. We just published uh, in, in both of these, the pivotal uh, data. Um, and as you can imagine, it's really good, both for the M6 and, and, and the simplify. Uh, a lot of uh, authors are there in, in, in the room with you. And um, this disc, um, I, I, I will tell you, is, is a very easy disc to put in. Uh, the outcomes in this pivotal trial, trial are good. It's a titanium on polyurethane disc, sort of like a, um, a more modern Brian disc. Uh, it, it, it has a more anatomic annulus around it. This is a polyethylene weave that's, that, that's around it. But this disc, like the Brian, allows for axial compression, axial loads to be placed on this disc. And the outcomes uh, in our pivotal, pivotal trial are quite good. Same with the, the uh, uh, simplified disc. And this is a really interesting disc in regards to the, uh, not only the kinematics, but the biomaterials. This is a peak on ceramic uh, disc. And so it's a very stealthy disc. All you see on the x-rays is, is the ceramic core and the end plates, the peak end plates. You don't see there is a titanium uh, plasma spray on it that you can see see a, a, a very little bit. But again, the outcome's extremely good. But what is most impressive to me is a very, very small MRI footprint that this has. As you see here, I mean, you really can't really even see this disc. This is the artificial disc right here. And the canal looks perfect. And as you see on this axial, the C7 nerve roots, you can see absolutely perfectly at that level that that disc was, was uh, in, implanted, which is really really impressive, uh, the, the low MRI footprint that this uh, disc has. What uh, is going uh, undergoing FDA uh, IDE trial right now, uh, our, group, our group is involved in all, all three of these, the Synergy disc, the Bagheera. Bagheera is a really neat looking uh, disc. It's got this black uh, sheen to it, we'll talk about in just a moment, uh, named Bagheera, named from the Black Panther and the children's 
uh, story, the, the Jungle Book. And uh, the Pro Disc C, the small keel, SK, and the Vivo, which is a non keel disc. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But the Synergy disc is a titanium on po polyethylene disc. And what's interesting about it, you can dial in, you, you can either put a neutral or a six degree lordotic uh, polyethylene core in that dials in six degrees of, of lordosis. And as compared to ACDF in a propensity scored matching uh, scheme. So the FDA has allowed rather than um, having patients not know whether they're going to end up with a fusion or an artificial disc, we have fusion um, uh, groups that, that do just the fusion and um, uh, groups, uh, researchers that just do the, the artificial disc. And then with propensity score matching, uh, uh, the FDA has allowed this, this sort of research scheme to, to be done. Um, which is, I think, very unique and actually good for us in, in regards to enrolling patients in, into the, a study like this. Um, the Bagara titanium uh, on polyethylene with this diamond-like carbon coating that gives us this black sheen, which is really, really neat looking. And if you want any more data on whether an artificial disc is the gold standard, what the FDA has allowed in, in this uh, randomization is, is it is using rather than fusion as the gold standard, the, the control, it's using another arthroplasty, the MOBI-C, in a two-to-one randomization fashion. So I think the FDA is seeing that, yeah, the gold standard for um, cervical disc disease for certain patient populations is an arthroplasty. Same with ProDisc-C, the, the SK small keel and the Vivo, the keelless. Um, this is a two-level study. Again, it's a cobalt chrome on poly, polyethylene disc that is the same uh, as like the original uh, ProDisc, but it also is uh, randomized to an artificial disc control. Again, the FDA has allowed the the sort of gold standard to be an artificial disc that we're comparing the investigational device to. Um, and the indications uh, uh, are expanded as well in regards to my myelopathy. This is a meta-analysis looking at cervical myelopathy and artificial disc replacement versus, versus fusion. I think in certain patient populations, this uh, is a very good indication for retrodiscal uh, pathology. And this meta-analysis showed that NDI and SF36 scores were better in the arthroplasty group compared, compared to the control. And what about two level indications? I think this is probably one of the better indications, even better than one level uh, in regards to um, improvement of outcomes, arthroplasty over, over fusion. And this is a very nice meta-analysis looking at 11 studies uh, that shows that the artificial disc is superior in regards to uh, effectiveness and safety over ACDF. And again, another study looking at multi-level uh, pathology, uh, cervical disc replacement versus fusion. And again, adjacent segment degeneration and subsequent surgeries better in the arthroplasty over the fusion group. We looked at uh, this uh, very, very carefully, two level ACDF versus fusion and found that artificial disc had same or improved patient reported outcomes. Artificial disc had lower rate of revision at the index level, as well as a lower rate of revision at adjacent levels. And the artificial disc had a lower rate of serious adverse events. So I think that clearly, if you're gonna do a two level uh, procedure, arthroplasty is shown to be uh, much better than a two-level uh, uh, fusion. And level one evidence supports uh, artificial disc over fu fusion for two-level pathology. And I think that um, clearly now for certain pa patient populations, uh, patient, a young patient with relatively normal facet joints, no significant disc space collapse, that the gold standard really is arthroplasty for a focal disc herniation, again, where anterior approach would be uh, best done. And arthroplasty has shown over multiple uh, data points now that it is better than, than a fusion. Again, I think we need to understand what the initial entrance criteria was. There was not significant degenerative changes. And I get concerned when um, sort of these, the, the criteria is expanded to, to allow artificial discs in very, very collapsed uh, or significant facet arthropathy, because I think that clearly the outcome uh, may not be as good. 
But our outcomes have shown to be profoundly good if these narrow um, inclusion exclusion criteria are, are kept. And as Jack said, level 1A evidence supporting arthroplasty overfusion. And uh, I'm super excited about not only the data that we have already collected, but we, we are currently collecting into our third decade of arthroplasty research. So thank you so much for your time and attention and congratulations again, Jens and Jack for putting on a fabulous conference. Thank you. Rick, thank you. Thanks for being a uh, part of this too. And uh, it's always a pleasure to, to uh, see your face and hear you talk. You just need the right uh, scrubs next time. That's right. Um, and I, you know, just the comment is the, the threshold for insurance approval has been easier with cervical than with lumbar because the indication is cervical radiculopathy or myelopathy. So, um, you know, it's, it's a more accepted surgical intervention. Uh, so I think it's been an easier bump to get over than lumbar where it's the low back pain, you know, kind of falling into a more subjective diagnosis. Um, but I, and I, I understand your comment about sticking strictly to the criteria and expecting you know the excellent results, and I think that's true. But I think there's also a time to start to expand the indications um, and kind of feel where the the envelope goes. And I you know I think we're in that era now where it's it's safer to push it a little bit. So uh, I do understand what you're saying. We have our safety net established with the FDA criteria, but. Um, I think that there's more to it. I think we've been very conservative with arthroplasty and there's probably a role, as Terry Marnay told us on Tuesday night at our motion uh, uh, seminar, um, that there are patients who could benefit from it um, who we need to push a little bit uh, in a scientific way. But, you know, thank you again, Rick. Thanks for being here and uh, hang on as long as you can. Lisa thank Ferrara you. is going to talk to us can, today. I, can, yeah. can I ask one more question? So first of all, congratulations again on your body of work. And you're such a uh, beacon also in terms of driving uh, great new techniques forward. And especially cervical disc arthroplasty is in my lifetime one of those true breakthrough technologies. And it's shown it. And thanks to you and to our TBI friends, this has been proven. My curiosity is... Um, I don't understand why cervical disc arthroplasty is not a greater mainstay uh, form of treatment in our teaching institutions and, uh, and beyond. When I ask our fellows, we have uh, six to seven clinical fellows always, maybe half of them have some disc arthroplasties, but the majority say, oh, we usually don't do disc arthroplasties. And it just drives me nuts how this has not become the preferred treatment for this degeneration in the parameters eloquently displayed by you. Where are we going wrong? Why do surgeons not push harder that this is the mainstay treatment? Jens, I think, I mean, that's a great question. I think it's multifactorial. Uh, clearly, it's harder to put in an artificial disc than do an ACDF. Still, I mean, my favorite operation is a one level ACDF. It's easy, it's fast, uh, the outcomes are really, really good. For me to do an arthroplasty, I have to put lead on. Uh, I've got to operate around the C-arm. I mean, in, in my opinion, you absolutely have to see the back of the disc space to safely put in an, an appropriate uh, art, artificial disc. And I don't need to do that for, for an ACDF. And also, Jens, I think, and Jack mentioned this a bit, frankly, I think the reimbursement issue is a big deal for many, many surgeons. I mean, you get paid less to do a harder operation. That's it. Being open about that because that's my great interpretation. Now, do insurance companies, in light of the overwhelming evidence, actually ever now suggest disc arthroplasty over fusions when a surgeon wants to fuse a patient? I tell you, I, I'm still ha at at some times, and actually not infrequently, struggle to get an arthroplasty approved. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <clears throat> Now you're making a difference and hopefully collectively we can we can change things around a little bit. And we'll talk more about that later with Armin's lecture. Very good. It. Thanks, Rick. Um, well, we, we uh, got Lisa Ferrara to give a lot of information to us.